Do you want to know something really interesting? I would. I love interesting things. So did you know that in Titanic, the multi-Oscar winning huge boatload of money, no pun intended. The best uh, movie ever made about a boat. I, I don't know. I think we got pretty close with Poseidon. You gave the best performance award to the boat. That's true. I did. Uh, <laughs> um, did you know that when Kate Winslet found out that she was going to have to be naked, in front of Leonardo DiCaprio, she flashed him when she met him. Really? Just to kind of get over the, the nerves of it? I suppose so. Just like... That's just crazy because she did the same thing to me, but we had no nude scenes together. So I don't know why that would happen. It explains why she wanted to work with James Cameron again with Avatar. She's like, I want to see them titties blue. That makes sense. <laughs> Gosh. I always knew there was something about that movie. Did you also know that the, the charcoal drawing of uh, Rose was actually done by James Cameron? No, but that's ridiculous. <laughs> that the director got to do that. Not only does the man get to explore the ocean and have multiple <laughs> billion dollar movies, he got to see Kate Winslet naked and draw her. That's ridiculous. He's like, no, 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 just come back to my trailer. I'll, I'll do the drawing. <laughs> Just come on back. Who is she, she not flashed at this point? Anyhow. Uh, sorry, Kate. Good question. Yeah, sorry, Kate. Hopefully, <laughs> hopefully you'll come on at episode 200. Friend of uh, the podcast, Kate Winslet. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for joining us for the Drive Back Podcast here today. The movie podcast where we imitate our favorite thing to do after a movie, which, of course, is to talk about it on the ride home. I'm Garrett. As always, I'm joined by my good friend and co-host, Adrian. Hey, how's it going? And uh, today, we're debuting another new episode type. Which is uh, which is called back to back. Which is what, Adrian? It's where Garrett and I sit back to back and watch the movie on two different screens. No, I'm just kidding. It's where we watch two movies. Uh, typically, either it's like doesn't quite qualify as a franchise with only two movies being in existence, or uh, it's like an original and then a remake. So two movies that are really closely tied together, whether through sequel ship, if that's a word, or by just being a remake. Uh, that's what a back to back is going to be. Remake, reimagining, sequel, you know, maybe the franchise wasn't good enough to get more than two. Like an example of a franchise could be uh, the, Wiz the Wizard of Oz and Oz the Great and Powerful. That could be an example of back to back. Well, of like there, there, was, was... there was Return to Oz. Oh, so it's a franchise. So he yeah. wouldn't make it in a back to back. Suicide Squad would be a. Uh, there you go. That's a, that's a good example. Yeah. Um, but today we've got a movie that was made in 2008 and then was immediately remade into an American film in 2010. Uh, talking about Let the Right One In and Let Me In, which don't get those two titles confused. They are uh, not the same. Well, it's the same movie. No. The, there, there's, it's all very much similar. No. <laughs> <laughs> Just the title. That's the only I disagree. Thing. I disagree. <laughs> Um, but uh, let's go ahead. We'll dive right into the first one today. Uh, the first one released in 2008 was Let the Right One In, directed by Thomas Alfredson. It stars Kari Hedebrandt, Lena Leanderson, and Per Ragnar. Oscar, an overlooked and bullied boy, finds love and revenge through Ellie, a beautiful but peculiar girl. Uh, so first off, you can watch this movie on uh, Let the Right One In is on Hulu. Uh, if yes. you have any interest in watching the movie, which, uh, I mean, no, no spoilers just yet. I would recommend people watch this movie. Totally. Yes. So uh, definitely check it out on Hulu if you get the chance. Um, kind of spoiler-free thoughts real quick before we uh, before we dive into the details. Have you seen this movie before? Yeah, I saw this. The I saw Let the Right One In when I was a child. That must have been interesting. And I've seen it numerous times since. Yeah, I'm very familiar with Let the Right One In. Gotcha. So, I mean, it's been, it was my first time watching it. I've been meaning to watch this movie for a very long time. Yeah, nice. Congratulations and, and well done. Thank you. I, uh, I've been working <laughs> hard for it, and uh, this isn't quite the accomplishment. Uh, what actually happened is your parents let you watch it finally. They said, yeah. you know what, Garrett? <laughs> You're <laughs> old enough. <laughs> they called me because they have access to our Google Sheets for the schedule, and they're like, you, you've unlocked it. We actually have a column for, is Garrett allowed to watch this movie? And his parents have to sign off with a DocuSign. It's an official binding document. <laughs> We've got to get Shout out to DocuSign. Uh, certify all your legal documents. <laughs> Can we get 
can we get DocuSign to sponsor? That would be fucking great. Please, DocuSign. That would fit us so much <laughs> if DocuSign was who ended up sponsoring. I mean, I wish we had DocuSign when we had Judy Dench. It would have made everything a lot easier. It really would have streamlined that whole process. I had to write... Not only it's not only just signing it. One, no pens. Weird rule by Dench's people. Only pencils and not number one, not number twos. Number one pencils had to be used. Oh wow! Something about real lead and it helping her skin. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it, it, that sounds right on brand for Judy. Um, but no, it's funny because you actually mentioned like this. This is an accomplishment that I was able to watch this movie. Actually, I have it, a signed certificate saying that I watched this movie right below my college degree on my wall. Well, equivalent. Actually, you should switch the order. Yeah, it's on, no, it's on top. It's Good. Just, yeah. It's up there Perfect. With it. Yeah. Perfect. In a in a better frame as well. <laughs> oh, it's it's gold. It's like twenty four yeah. karat gold. Um, but uh, yeah, so, since this was my first time watching the movie, I really enjoyed it. Um, yeah, it's we'll, a great we'll, movie. We'll get into some of the key differences between the two uh, a little bit later. I think we'll do kind of a a slimmer review of each one, and then talk about maybe some differences and some similarities and what we like better about each one. Um, this one, I think that this one has a lot more implied violence. Mm. It's not as overt as the, the remake is. Um, and there's a lot more, and, and maybe, maybe it's that, that situation where so it's because it's in a foreign language that it kind of just feels more mysterious. But I feel like this one, again, maybe it's that situation where because it's a foreign film, it feels much more real, and it feels much more, uh, I guess, tangible would be the right word, uh, as sure. opposed to the sequel, which nothing wrong against the sequel. But I, there's no major problems with it. It's just it's maybe it's because it's what we're used to, and it's a little bit more pulpy than what we get here. It's kind of a weird observation to make, but well, I think that was by design. I mean, without getting into spoilers, I think the first one was more of uh, like an art piece yes and the second one is definitely a without revealing my full opinions a cash grab interesting all right um but yeah so we'll, we're gonna go ahead and drop spoiler warning for uh let the right one in um again you can watch it on hulu that being said that is the warning we are moving on uh to some spoiler territory and kind of diving more into that, this one felt much more like a twisted love story than the remake does. Yeah, for better, I, I feel. Definitely. And I think that it's also in that, it's also a little bit more of a horror movie. Because, it, again, maybe it's because of the implied violence. One of my biggest issues with the sequel, or the, not the sequel, the remake, is that... Um, Specifically, the scene where uh, Ellie or Abby, I think, is her Allie or whatever it is in the, the American yeah, version. I think it's Ellie. Yeah. Um, when they're in the tub, which is their kind of makeshift coffin, and the gentleman walks in and gets attacked by her, and he, he's not supposed to enter the bathroom, but he does. Yeah, the American version, you, it's much more graphically violent. Which, where the original is much more implied. It's a lot scarier. Yeah. Because you don't know what's happening. You're like Oscar in that situation. Well, I think that's one of those whole things that, that horror really gets away from, at least in America. I think foreign horror still holds on to a lot of this. And you can see a lot of it in A24 horror movies. Uh, but the scariest thing in the world to human beings is the unknown. When you show me violence, okay, yeah, it's gory. Okay, cool, that's a cool effect. But it's not scary. What's scary is not knowing what's happening. And that is what the first movie does so well that it's shocking. It's it's just extremely well done. Yeah, exactly. And even when they do get big budget, a favorite moment of the movie just in general is when she enters, uh, she's trying to prove right, she, she never outright, oh, big spoiler here, she's a vampire. Um... But uh, when she, because she never says it in the movie, um, yeah. but so when she's trying to kind of show what she is, she enters the apartment without permission, and that bleeding from like every orifice is a really cool effect that sells everything you need to sell in one shot. Yeah, definitely. 
um, it's like you were saying, it's much more of an art piece. And I guess maybe it, it's more akin to an A24 film, like you're saying in that regard. And I mean, I, I don't want to get into too much of direct comparison, but I know that um, someone on set taught like from the second one, maybe even the director was said the first one, let the right one in is a movie about children's relationships that happens to feature vampires in it. And then the second movie, Let Me In, is the exact opposite of it, and it's a vampire movie that happens to feature a children's relationship. And that's the entire difference of the movies, right? The, the first one is about the little boy letting the right one into his heart and her letting the right one in to her world. And the second one is more the vampire perspective saying, Let Me In. It's more demanding. It's more... It's more sinister, and it's less about that that dynamic. Yeah, it, I. What's funny is now that you say that, I really kind of see that. But initially, my my impression was it was just different plays on the idea that vampires have to be invited in, and in both cases, you know, the the boy is inviting her in. So the just, second one is let me in, right? It's yeah. much more, yeah. Which what you're saying, the second one, the second, the remake is more aggressive. It's more violent. So that does make a lot of sense. Yeah. And to me, it loses a little bit of the touch of, right? I think in the first one, we can all kind of identify with, with the children and like him being bullied. And you can kind of feel like, oh, like you, you identify, you can relate, you can be empathetic towards it more. And in the second one, it's just straight up more of an American horror movie to me. And one scene I want to talk about, too, in particular, that I think really identifies it, right? And actually, there's two points that I'll make. The first one is in the very beginning when you see, what is his name, Harkin? Uh, which character are we talking about? The one that feeds her in the beginning, the her old guardian. gentleman. I, I don't, I don't, does he have a name? Her what is it? Does he, no, I'm saying, does he have a name? Yeah, it's like Her Harkin or Heron or something. I thought he was always just kind of like, Hammond? The Guardian. But anyway, when he when you first see him in the woods, that shot style to me sets up the whole movie where okay, you see two people talking in the woods, and then you again you're obscured, your vision is obscured by the trees, and then you kind of start to piece together that he's actually strangling this man. And then so methodically, with no emotion, he strings this guy up and starts draining his blood. Like that's scary. Because you have, it's so, like, he's done it before, clearly. There's no pre-malice to it. There's no premeditated shot that shows what's going to happen or is overly scary. It's just a fact mm -hmm. in the first one that this is happening. And that's, to me, scary. Kind of like how a lot of people really like Halloween because there is no reason to why he's murdering. He's just a killer. And that's yeah. terrifying to people. And then the second point that I really like from the first one is there's a big thing about her not wearing shoes in both movies. The second movie makes a huge deal of her not wearing shoes and being barefoot all the time. And to me, the second one forces it down your throat a little more, like spoon feeds it as if, again, my whole thing about like, show me, don't tell me. I think the second movie tells a lot more and the first one is really good at showing. Mm -hmm. and, and knowing when not to show. Yeah, exactly. It's, yeah. it's, there's a reason it's gone down as famous for being what it is. Yeah. And kind of on the uh, on the topic of the the guardian character, which I just checked, his name is Hawken. Um, oh, we're, so we're, close! We're probably butchering that because it's not <laughs> our our native language. Um, I actually like the guardian character better in the in the remake, and I'll talk about really? it a little more when we get there. Um, this in this one, I don't know. I. Maybe it's the fact that I mean, like I love Richard Jenkins as an actor, but in the second movie he feels scarier because they almost take him in like a zodiac ish direction with like his outfit and and again I'll get more into it when we get talk about the second one. Yeah, but you know this movie it, it's it's still frightening. Like again, like the fact that he's like hanging people upside down, he's you know draining them of their blood which i mean i'm sorry like if i'm looking at, if i'm thinking of any other vampire media ever primarily castlevania they do talk about if they have a if they can't get human blood they'll consume like pig's blood or something like there's gotta be easier ways 
Enter <laughs> Dr. Morbius. <laughs> oh, God. The crossover <laughs> we don't need. Um, that would have been really funny if he had like a, his like girlfriend's name was like Ellie or something. That would have been funny. Um, just as a reference. Uh, but like, they're, like it just, it, it's, I'm not saying it's shoehorned in. It's a great way of building tension and scares by having a guardian that's essentially going out and serial killing people, which, I mean, the other thing I want to touch on this movie, sort of both, is the adherence to, like, actual vampire mythos. Like, the, the, you have to be invited in, or, like, the spontaneous combustion when you're, you know, exposed to sunlight, and the, like, all the things that go into That's it. That's only in one of the movies. What? The spontaneous no, combustion. No, it's in both. Not the same way it is in the second one, I feel. Well, there's sunlight, and then it it kills yeah. the vampire. Like, I guess that's combustion, yeah. I think it happens differently in each movie. <laughs> well, what, what, <laughs> they, they get exposed to sunlight, they catch on fire. Yeah, fair enough. How long it takes is a matter <laughs> of seconds. <laughs> but anyhow... Um, but it's just refreshing that they didn't try to like, you know, I'm I'm more used to the kind of fantasy vampire stuff like in D and D and where they don't have this sort of like you have to invite me in, you have to like oh uh, garlic, you know, like that's because that's stupid in my opinion. Yeah, vampires should be more powerful because they're just more powerful. Um, but really, really cool stuff here, and just again visually, I need to talk about the best moment in this movie. And I don't know if you have a, a favorite moment. It might sure, be the I'll same as mine. And that would be the ending sequence in the pool house. Of course. It's the staple of the film. Which is one of the best horror movie moments I've ever seen. And again, what you're talking about not showing is so key to this scene being pulled off. Yes. Like, it's so much... Like, you know what's happening. But you're like, why can't I just see a little part of it? And that must have happened in the, you know, the writer's room for the American version. Because you do see cuts to it every once in a while. But, oh, gosh, is it so cool. Like when, the, when the drag through the water and then you just, like, it, everything's muffled because it's, oh, it's just, it's fantastic. I think we should introduce the second move, Let Me In, and then talk about that. Because we're just comparing the two, so I feel like That's we should point. get... The other one out of the way, too. Yeah. Do we want to give a little quick review of this one first before we do that? Or do you want to do that at the end? We can do them together at the end. Sure. Just because we're just comparing them back and forth. So. All righty. So let's go ahead and jump into the remake. Released two years later in 2010, Let Me In was directed by Matt Reeves, who's actually the director of The Batman and the, the trilogy of Planet of the Apes movies. Um, and stars Cody Smith McPhee, Chloe Grace Moretz, and Richard Jenkins. A bullied young boy befriends a young female vampire who lives in secrecy with her guardian. So already you know that the this the remake is a little more overt in its messaging. I mean, yeah, I feel like the diehard fans of Let the Right One In knew already she was a vampire, so you're not really spoiling anything. Um, but I feel like. The characters have to be so dumb in these movies to not know that, like, oh, I have bite marks on my neck. I should probably go outside in daylight. Like, it's it's so both versions. It's incredibly stupid. Like, we all know what a vampire is. You you should know. Yeah, but if you had two bites on, well, I guess if I got attacked and then had two bites, if then I yeah. felt weak and woozy, like I had just had blood drawn, and I wake up with two holes in my neck. I'm going to keep my windows closed until it's dark. <laughs> um, and then I'll try the pig blood, you know, if it's a good substitute. Sure. Um, but I, this is my first time watching this one, too. I hadn't seen either of them. And I'm, and I'm, you saw, did you see Let Me In when it first came out as well? Yeah, I went to the theaters. Okay. Um, so upon first viewing, there are a lot, a lot of this movie I like as much as the original. Which seems pretty spot on because the like the Metacritic rating is only one point differential between these two. It's like what I have it right here. Um, it's for so let the right one in has an eighty two. Oh, it's not. So it's not that much different. So let the right one in has an eighty two, and let me in has a seventy nine. So they're very close. Um, and if you talk to horror movie fans, 
the majority of them say that they're they're both just as good as the other, but for different reasons. Like each one has its its you know its pros and its cons, as anything should. But it is the same core story, just in a different location. Um, and I get that here. However, my my downsides with this one is it has some wonky VFX. Um, yeah, like the tunnel scene where she's attacking that guy. We, yeah, it it looks weird. But like in retrospect, I was thinking about it, and it's like we obviously we don't know how powerful a vampire would be. It could wrestle someone around like that, but then but the human being looks like it's moving faster than it should too. So there's some weird moments. The it works a little bit better in the bathroom when the police officer is killed. It's, it it feels much more overtly violent and scary that time. But specifically, the tunnel sequence is a little a little odd. Um, but also, but even like to me, I think the, the like the face morphing stuff that happens, I think, yeah, okay, it might be better CGI, but it loses to me the the actual feel that it's really happening because you can tell it's CGI. Yeah, which, or as I think in the first one, they literally put like a a adolescent man in her body <laughs> in place of her. Like for a circus that. performer, <laughs> like like, yeah, go like there you go. Look, it looks so different in the first one. Uh, but one of the interesting things too, though, is to think that I was thinking about is: Do you think that they they showed more of the violence? They showed more of like what we're saying is the wonky VFX, like the power, I guess you could say, of the character. Do you think they showed more of it because this movie had a higher budget and could achieve or try to achieve? what they couldn't with the original or do you think it was just the american sensibility to make it more violent and therefore it's more scary that the latter see i think it's a mix of both mm. like i think i disagree like, like i'll it, give, can I give can i give an example of why i disagree sure so there's a scene in the first one where the nurse is walking up to the hospital and uh the vampire is already on the hospital but you you, you aren't drawn to her yet and then she starts scaling the building and you're like, oh, crap. Like, she was there the whole time. That's so crazy. And then in the second one, obviously, they use a CGI person to climb the, the tower because that's easy enough. But not only do they just use a CGI person because it's easy and it looks fine. They also make a light turn off to force your attention up there because they feel like you won't catch it if you aren't paying attention. I think I think the movie's dumbed down. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't notice that. I'll have to go back and watch it because that's, that seems like I'm totally missing something there. Like, in the like they literally universe. make there's a, on the building. There's only one light that turns off right before she starts moving in the second one to draw your attention, to make sure that the audience sees the action. Cause otherwise it'd be in shadow like the first one and the casual movie goer sitting on their couch at home would miss it. It's a very good point. Uh, but I feel like, Maybe I'll play devil's advocate and say that you have to dumb down movies for American audiences. That's we, fine. I believe you. That's not the devil's yeah. advocate. I believe that, but that does that so means it's a less good movie to me. <laughs> it's it's different culture making it, I guess. Like the different culture of moviegoers. To I guess it's time for me to move to Sweden. Uh, probably. <laughs> Been saying that. Well, not now. Apparently, they're getting yeah, not all now. sorts of fingers waved at them. Um, but. Uh, as a whole, though, I do enjoy... Like, and by the way, uh, Let Me In is available on Netflix uh, yeah. for anyone who wants to watch it, um, which I do recommend. I would recommend watching both so you can kind of see the difference and kind of get two different sensibilities of the same story. Um, but I... I one the, again, one of the reasons I like this film is Richard Jenkins. I feel like he gave a much better performance as the Guardian than the Guardian in the first film. Give you that yeah i think he is he's pretty incredible in the role i think he really feels like real like that's a real character yeah which like usually i fall into the trap of saying that in a foreign film i feel like the characters are much more real because i maybe i don't speak the language so it feels like much more of a genuine performance but with this one richard jenkins's performance felt more real because also he was in it i felt a little bit more oh, yeah maybe and a little bit I think to the detriment of the movie, yeah. Sure. Um, but like like when he's in the back seat and he has the trash bag on his head, like well now now I kinda know where some of the Riddler stuff came from in the Batman. <laughs> but 
it's it's horrifying like that is so much scarier for american audiences because of like the truck stop killers and people that will get into your car when you're you know or like the people thought would get into their car and kill them when they took off from the gas station like that is a scary thought as much as it is to meet someone out on you know the walking path in the middle of your city and also the i mean the fact that he, he feels like he has to cover his face like that just like from that point of view that feels smarter to me than the original version's character who just wouldn't wear anything yeah but you got to think why are you wearing a mask if you're gonna kill a person well if they get away but that's well in the second one he had the whole contingency plan with the the acid true and I'll, I I agree with you that uh, about the fear, and I think it's a more a, a more direct sense of of villainy from the second. It's a different one. sense of fear. Uh, yeah, but I I also think again that they kind of force it down your throat. In the first one, you piece it together that she also found the caretaker at a young age, just like she did again, and that he's been with her for all this time because of how old she is. And in the second move, you piece that together in the first one. In the second one, they literally just show you a photo to make sure that the audience knows. I feel like it loses, like, I'm all for movies happening to me. And I get that a lot of people view movies as like a passive art experience. But I want to be giving them some credit and being able to figure out a plot point. Like, that's the reason why Knives Out and new movies that make you think do so well is because the audiences do want to think. They want to feel like they solved something. Or that they have a fun fact that they can tell their friends. And I feel like after, when you watch the second one, everybody's aware of everything because they just spoon feed it to you. Yeah. I, w- I was going to say, like, horror audiences are different in the fact that, like, a lot of time they just want the scares. But then I, I would immediately be hypocritical because I like movies like Hereditary or uh, Midsommar more than, like, you know, Paranormal Activity or something like that. You know what I mean? Totally, and I think that hits exactly how I feel about the second one, is I feel like it is trying to be so many things that I think it loses a little bit of what the first one had so well, which is purity in what its, in what its goal was. Now, I do think that is studio interference. Agree. Yeah, because I, Matt Reeves is a very talented director, and I haven't seen a movie of his that I haven't liked. And... He, and I, and the, one, the one thing I will say, I think this may be a controversial opinion. You'll have to let me know. I think the remake, let me in, is shot a little bit better. Like the actual cinematography is a little bit better. Yeah, I think it's, well, I think that's the uh, higher budget as well. True. Maybe they had access to, or maybe, because I, I think the first film isn't like, it's it's like an independent film. Yep. So it's it's a lot more lower budget. So they, so they don't have, Not I'm not saying that the cinematographer isn't talented. They were. It's a very good looking movie, especially the boathouse sequence, which in the remake is not as good, but it's still the climactic section, if that makes sense. Like, yeah. The whole point of these back to back episodes when we do remakes is to assess which one was, you know, which, what, like compare and contrast. And also, I have to clarify, I by no means think Let Me In is a bad movie. Just it's in just comparison. When you, yeah, when you compare it to the original, I'm very passionate about Let the Right One In. Oh, absolutely. And, and I can understand why. And, and, and spoiler alert for my scores, I think the, the original was better too. Um, but like when it comes to American horror movies, Let Me In is... Oh, it's it stands top. among the top. If you yeah. just if you isolate it, if it came out by itself as like an original film like the first one did, I bet it would be talked about equally as much in horror as the first one is. Like, I think it would be incredible. Yeah, definitely. So... Um, but I mean, that's that's all I really have to say about these movies. They're they're fantastic horror movies with an adherence to vampire lore that is awesome. Um, you get you get some pretty great performances in both. Um, you, there's there's points we can made about who was the better girl and who was the better boy, um, which I would say probably both of them were better in the original. Yeah. Um, just the range of emotion, I think, was a little better, or the feeling of emotion was felt, a little better. Again, I'm falling into that trap. It felt a little bit more real from the foreign language one. Um, but there is one thing I wanted to point out, and that was the there is the moment when um, Ellie or Allie or Abby, whatever the name is in the American one, 
comes into the boys' bedroom, and they're they're basically talking about going to them, right? And there's a line that she eleven says, year old conversation, right? <laughs> um, there's that conversation they have about would you would you like me if I wasn't a girl? And I was and I and I originally I I thought about that for a moment because well and I want to get your feedback on like the importance of that line because what it, what it stuck out to me was that not like or the like I guess the the part of it that was most key to me was that vampires are inherently sexual like no matter what lore you look at them in and whether that's like gender fluid or being more kind of pansexual as opposed to like heterosexual maybe that's what it was alluding to but i also kind of got the idea that it was kind of more her like i'm just a creature like i that's what i read it as the latter is like would you like me if i wasn't human but she doesn't say human. She says, "You would you like me if I wasn't a girl," which yeah. But I think right at the like that's what he in in how do I say, in uh, in old practices around the time this movie was made. That is what she would anticipate a young boy to like is another young girl. Mm-hmm. So I, I can I read it as like, would you like me if I wasn't like? Obviously, you like a girl. Would you like me if I wasn't a girl? Mm-hmm. It. I don't know. It was just a weird. Kind I see of, what you're saying. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm not seeing anything here, but I was double checking because I, th- I thought there was something in lore about like changing gender or something like that, but I guess I could be wrong. Um, maybe I'm just thinking of some other form of media, but I don't know. That that line stuck out to me because I was like, why yeah. why would that be so important? You know, why 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 in both versions, why choose the word? Would you like me if I wasn't a girl? That felt that stuck out to me. Whereas, like, I don't know, it, it, like if it, I guess that has more poignancy than being, would you like me if I wasn't human? You know, because that kind I of think, gives again, things it's, away. It's, I think originally that line was probably chosen because it's again less on the nose. Yeah. Like had she said that in the first one, it would just be kind of egregious that she's not human. It'd be like, we know. Mm-hmm. Like you don't have to tell us. That would again would be that hand holding. Um, and I think that they didn't want to do that. So I think they and I mean they kind of do right with the with the other lady that gets bitten when she says, I don't I'm not human anymore. Like, yeah. they kind of hint at it in other ways, but I think if she were to say it, it would have been too egregious. Okay. That's fair. But I, I totally, I think you very valid point. I would love if I could talk to one of the direct, like, the original director and find out what that was all about. Yeah, let's get Tomas on here. Friend of the show, Tomas Albertson. Speaking of, come on down. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> no, that, we, we can only do that. We can only pull that kind of stunt off once every hundred episodes. Um... Which stay in t- stay tuned for episode two hundred in two years. <laughs> Start teasing it now. <laughs> um, but uh, let's I mean let's go ahead and give some uh, some final thoughts, maybe some scores, and then we can uh, talk about what's coming up next on the podcast. We've got some uh, some spicy episodes coming up, but uh, let's go ahead and get into it. I think it's my it's my first time my first time watching both. Jeez, Louise, I can't speak English today. Um, so I guess I can give my final opinions on both uh, and the scores of each. Um, so for the let one right, uh, let the right one in. I said that it was brilliantly dark and emotionally detached. Let the right one in is how you do a vampire movie right. While it may stumble a little bit in its second act, its brilliant third act more than makes up for it. Um, so with that in tow, I gave let the right one in an eighty-eight. And then uh, for Let Me In, I said retold beautifully. Reeves Let Me In is more than a capable, uh, a more than capable remake that only suffers from some wonky VFX and more shown violence instead of implied. Um, that being said, it wasn't too much different. I did give Let Me In an eighty-three. Mm, okay. So I'm not scoring them based on how they are against each other. It's, I'm scoring them like I'd score any other movie independently. The conversation is where we compare them. Absolutely, but, uh, Adrian. What did you give the the movie for some thoughts and some scores? Yeah, so for the first one, which uh, obviously has a nostalgic place in my head, it was shown to me at a very young age. It's part of my 
horror movie love foundation on my uh, hierarchy of needs. Uh, it's down there at the bottom. So because of that, I gave it a 90. All right. And uh, the second one, uh, just like you said, yeah, it's great. If it were to stand alone, it would be among the giants of horror. I'd, I'd probably put it right up there with, with Hereditary and some of the others that are really, really iconic. However, it does fall suit to it being a remake, and thus I do have to compare it to me because another one exists of the exact same concept um, because that I gave this one an 80. I gave him a 10-point difference. Uh, also still really good. Um, just just loses a bit in being a little too egregious and a little too too uh, out in front with it in terms of a lot of what it's trying to tell you, and the first one is a little more subtle. Sure. It, it, it's almost like... What I always tell people is when people ask me how I score movies and like why I do and things like that, um, I look at it like an assignment in a schoolroom. So like every student gets the same assignment, which is to make a movie. And then they hand that project in, which is their movie. And then I score it based on individually and based on, you know, a couple of my key, you know, plot, like not plot lines, but <laughs> like objectives and things like that. Right. And it's for I guess for you it's kind of like oh this student kind of copied off of this person but made some good improvements so or like you know or like not good improvements but like did enough to make it different that it didn't. A lot of students nowadays will recognize turnitin.com as a plagiarism <laughs> identifier, and this movie exceeded ninety percent <laughs> plagiarism. And guess what that means? You get expelled. <laughs> college so <laughs> i think i'm being pretty generous to this movie but for me i almost looked at this kind of like uh someone did like a book report and you know it was the same book that they were uh, sorry there we go um someone did, it was the same book that they wrote their project on but worded it slightly differently that's that's the way i kind of looked at it but yeah. <sighs> Again, yeah, I get it. I just feel like, I mean, if you look at this movie, here's one last comparison. There's a little YouTube videos on it. This movie is almost, the second movie is like 80% shot for shot of the first one, but flipped. Almost as if Matt Reeves didn't want it to be a copy, <laughs> including the end credits. The first one is white text on black, and in the second one, it's black text on white. It's literally almost shot for shot. even like when they're sitting in the train and he's tat and he's finger uh, he's doing Morse code. Yeah, I noticed box, that. that shot's flipped. It's it's literally it's literally someone turning it and going, "Oh, someone submitted this last year, so the teacher won't notice." <laughs> <laughs> it was two years ago when you yeah. the actual release date. Um, but uh, that is going to bring us to an end for episode one oh one, our first back to back special. Hey, Adrian. It's been 101 episodes, but if someone wants to follow us to get some tasty updates and maybe some exclusive uh, Instagram art that we haven't been doing for a while, um, where can they do that? Uh, that would be at the Drive Back Podcast. So that's going to be anywhere that you want to follow us, whether that's Apple Podcasts. If you give us a five-star review, we'll give you a shout-out. That's the, the, the Drive Back Podcast. Spotify, uh, go ahead and give us a follow there. Uh, we post every Monday on all platforms and on YouTube. Uh, you can actually watch videos of us talking to each other and reviewing these movies. Uh, and you can go ahead and subscribe. And we also do a little bit of exclusive content uh, whenever we can. Uh, we got a long backlog of movies, but whenever we can squeeze an extra one in or a midnight premiere, we end up throwing those up on YouTube exclusively uh, that are like some midnight premiere kind of stuff or things like that. So check us out there. Uh, and then on Instagram, the Drive Back Podcast, where uh, now that we are 100, uh, we will resume our Instagram posts. And uh, now that they're, I, uh, I, I made it less work. Okay? I was editing Instagram <laughs> posts that took like a day because they, they were so complex, but I've simplified it. So it should be nice and easy to go ahead and post them up and, uh, and get you guys commenting and all that again. So uh, check us out there at the Drive Back Podcast. Sounds good. Next week, we have a rewatchable. We're going to be rewatching the 2009 Zack Snyder film Watchmen. Um, which if you want to watch it beforehand and then watch, uh, be able to, you know, think about it while we talk about it, um, it is able to watch on Hulu. Uh, it was on Netflix, but now it's on Hulu. So there you go. Um, other than that, we are in the 100s. So uh, let us know if there's anything you'd like to see us cover, anything you'd like to see us do on our YouTube channel, which since we're now pretty much not established, but, you know, we're 
we're, we're, we're doing healthy at 100 episodes. We really want to start expanding our content. So let us know if there's anything you'd like to see us do, anything that uh, sounds like a good idea, whatever it may be. Let us know on Instagram. It's probably the best way to get in contact with us. So Yeah. But uh, thanks so much for watching. Thanks so much for listening. Here's to the next 100 episodes. We'll see you next time here on The Drive Back. Thank you for listening to this episode of The Drive Back. Make sure to be on the lookout for new episodes every Monday. And make sure to follow us on social media.